one thing is very clear that every year is a year of transformation and we've been doing things differently and we've been trying to do things that is in the best interest of how we wanted the organization to grow and and, and progress Welcome to Tech Innovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Satya Jayadev. Satya is the Chief Information Officer of Skyworks Solutions, a nearly $5 billion revenue semiconductor company. He's been in his role for roughly six years, and in that time, Satya has led his team through what he refers to as a journey from business enabler to business driver to business visionary. Satya has also thought creatively about how to weave technology and business disciplines across the typical chasm between tech and other functions by hiring non-tech business leaders in IT, while encouraging his peers outside of IT to hire their own tech talent. I look forward to covering these topics, among others, through this conversation. Satya, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. It's my pleasure as well. Thank you for uh, for having me on this podcast. No, it's a pleasure. I'm really looking forward to the conversation, Satya. Well, perhaps we begin with an overview of your company, if you don't mind, Satya, Skyworks Solutions. For those who may be less familiar with it, could you spend a little time enlightening us as to the business you're in? Absolutely. So Skyworks is a semiconductor organization. We make high-performance analog semiconductors um, that is actually empowering the wireless revolution, as we call it. Um, uh, so we we call it as a, a process of connecting people, places, and things. Um, so our, our products are uh, are within the aerospace industry, within automotive, uh, broadband, cellular, connect at home. If we have a router at home, uh, chances are that we have our product in that. Uh, industrial, medical, you know, all the way up to the wearables market. So uh, anywhere you see wireless connectivity, the need for ubiquitous, uh, always on connectivity, then you probably are going to see a Skyworks product in there. Uh, a fantastic organization. We have a great engineering team, and we also have our own manufacturing fabs and factories across the world. Uh, amazing talent, great people. Uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting time for the semiconductor space, right? We have seen sort of like the bellwether of uh, the markets too good or bad first goes through the semiconductor industry before it starts having a ripple effect across other other industries. So a uh, great time to be a part of this uh, this organization. And um, uh, I think you, you, you're hearing about AI, the advent of AI and all of that. So everything starts from here. So that's how we, we see ourselves. That's a great description. Looking forward to delving more deeply into some of the topics you've already mentioned. But before we do, I'd also love to have you describe your purview as chief information officer. No two CIO roles are exactly alike. Uh, talk about a bit what's uh, you know within the span of responsibilities for you. Absolutely. So from a from a from a CIO perspective, uh, uh, my accountability is end to end IT, uh, which uh, which also includes uh, security, as uh, the CISO also reports into the organization. Obviously, I've got uh, the global infrastructure, the global network, and we also lead uh, the, go the, the global uh, applications, which includes the enterprise suite of applications, the manufacturing systems, the engineering systems. Uh, we, we also um, uh, own data, which is uh, a hugely uh, popular topic these days. And uh, we also have an AI enablement office, which is uh, all about trying to understand uh, where do we see um, uh, opportunities and in today's world, every nail seems like an AI nail, but so all of those is a, a, a you know, roll into the IT organization. And, and then there's also one more function that we've just added, which is uh, uh, EDA or electronic design automation. And when I say EDA, it's uh, the infrastructure part of EDA, which includes uh, high performance compute and uh, storage. That is uh, extremely important for our engineering community. And that is also a part of the IT organization as we speak. And uh, Apart from that, I also lead our, our enterprise digital transformation program, and uh, which is uh, intended to uh, to modernize uh, to modernize our solution, its uh, optimization of our platforms, making sure that uh, we look at it, uh, we, we look at process and uh, technologies, and build a best in class uh, that is a, a fusion of both. Uh, that's also part of my organization as well. Well, speaking of transformations, I know you've been on quite a, uh, quite a transformation since your arrival in role a bit more than six years ago. I wonder if you can describe the IT department you found upon joining uh, Skyworks Solutions and and a bit about that transformation that that that's occurred in the past uh, half dozen years. Oh, absolutely. Um, half a dozen makes it feel like a long time, though. But uh, <laughs> but I think uh, it's it's a phenomenal journey in terms of how. Uh, uh, how I saw what, what what we did and what as a as a team we built over the, over the course of time. One thing is very clear that every year is a year of transformation, 
and we've been doing things differently and we've been trying to do things that is in the best interest of how we wanted the organization to uh, to grow and 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 progress uh when i joined uh, skyworks we were about two and a half three billion dollar company and now we are we are close to a five billion dollar company and we are we'd be doing uh, a lot of different things that's uh, that's that's being powered by technology these days so when i initially came in there was a, there was a gap there was definitely a huge gap between the partnership between it and the business we were seen mostly as a support function or primarily as a tech support organization all the hallmarks of how um, uh, it hadn't taken a front seat to drive things and we we had a lot of we had a lack of maturity in our it processes uh, the way that we did things um, uh, very uh, heavily on Excel, uh, uh, and we, need, we needed to globalize, standardize, and centralize. Those were some of the things that we had to start doing. But the most important thing was uh, people transformation. I found that we had some uh, some very good folks, and then we, we didn't have, and some, there, there were some folks who weren't aligned with what the organization wanted to do. So we had to do some optimization on that uh, on that space. Uh, some basic things weren't there. Like for example, you needed to have a good balance between um, a good checks and balance between infrastructure and security. They, they had to be two different roles because one is supposed to build it and the other one's supposed to audit it. Uh, so we we didn't have those. So we, we had to separate those and build separate towers for that. Put together the foundational blocks for what was going to be a, a great journey for us, especially since uh, Skyworks was was uh, was trying to harp into the into the 5G bandwagon because we were we were trying to work towards uh, towards making that 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 5G possibility uh, with with our with our with our products and all that. So uh, the intent was to focus on competitive IT and not on commodity IT, right? I mean, I had to gauge uh, how much of our of my team members were working closely with the business, adding to the value of the product, versus how many of my folks were were on the back end of IT. Every company does uh, like a virtualization. Every company does network management. Every company does back uh, like a backup management. But what adds to the competitive nature of what we do is how do we take a project from conception to uh, to to like fruition within a short period of time, and how do we make sure that we add to that value? So I wanted to see how can I shift more people on that side and leave this part of it to the people who do it better. So that was the thing that we wanted to focus on. We also wanted to have a BRM BPO approach. A business relationship manager should be paired up with a business process owner, and then we then are able to move projects faster. And uh, IT needed to be the enabler, right, and the one that was driving these things forward. So a lot of things that we had to. But I didn't want to go to the business and say, "Hey, tomorrow we're going to be a team that's going to work closely with you." Uh, but we had to put together the people that are going to drive the process standardization or the optimization, and then they were going to use the right technologies to help solution shape for the for the business. So it was it was a journey that we had to take and we had to work towards getting there. But once we got there, it was a good, good fast move from there on. One of the ways in our past conversations, Satya, that you I, I found so compelling in terms of the way in which you encapsulated your vision for the transformation you just described is going from uh, business enabler to business driver to business visionary. I, I really liked that uh, stair stages, uh, stair steps, if you will, uh, uh, across what is uh, certainly implied to be greater levels of value. And uh, I wonder if you could take a bit of uh, time just to define each of the terms and with us lingering, especially on on the vision of becoming a business visionary. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. That's a great question. I think uh, I, I see this like a, a metamorphosis of a butterfly, right? From a caterpillar to a butterfly. I think that's the, the thing that, that we're trying to see. The intent was for IT to also be a good support organization, but more importantly, be the ones that were closely padding up to the business to drive what we wanted to do. We needed to understand how the company made money. That was a basic thing of what we wanted to do. We wanted to know what we needed to do to help with the top line growth and the bottom line growth. And we needed to understand what were uh, the pain points of the business and, and all of that. So I think we we brought in the right people who had a more of a business background with a good technology bent. The, the ability to fuse things together, the ability to be that the techno functional leaders is what we wanted to. So we brought the right people in and we started to, 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 to get them more immersed into the business. I think that was uh, the first step in terms of what we did. The foundational model was um, I want you to be a business leader first and then a technology leader after that. So that was what we we did. And then uh, this thing called COVID came along. And, uh, and I think that kind of shifted the focus because we everybody wanted to work from anywhere, from everywhere. 
and the distributed computing. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, that you know came along, and uh, we delivered what the business wanted, right? Um, uh, and I think as we started to do that, and the business started, and that was also the time when 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 five G was was at its peak too. So we were it was a very busy time for us. But we delivered to that expectation. As we did that, it, we, we gained the confidence of the business, right? Uh, the former SA, uh, SAP CEO used to say, used to call, call this um, that, you know, credibility is earned in drops and lost in buckets. And I think uh, that's true. And as we earned that credibility, um, post-COVID world, we were asked to uh, join in these ideation uh, meetings and things and things like that because they knew IT could uh, Deliver to what we needed, and then let's let's partner, let's collaborate, and we, we could see a lot of traction that was happening. That was the next part of this metamorphosis, and I think as as that started to happen, uh, again the advent of AI, all of those coming together, they started to look at us as a visionary organization to say, help us to ideate, help us to sit together. What can we do? Uh, thinking about how, what can we do with data, what can we do with uh, with apps modernization, how can we uh, we help you with your with your process transformation, and I think those were the things that that put us now at the you know center of attention. And we we also had done um, uh, an acquisition in the in the in the middle of it where IT kind of took the lead in terms of the the you know integration and all that. So lots of credibility earns and drops in many different areas kind of helped us to move forward with all of that. And that was where we uh, we we started to take a. A, a center seat when it came to driving um, our, our own digital transformation strategy and what we wanted to do uh, uh, as we as we started looking uh, you know five years down the road where did we want to be how do we move this engine forward how do we collaborate with the business how do we be the how do we create more change agents within within the within the business world and things like that those were some of the things that uh, we we started to do and that was a complete metamorphosis of 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 you know what we did one thing we were very clear of is that we didn't want to lose steam. And there was a lot of things happening every year. We started off with a with a security transformation, then we then we moved towards uh, an infrastructure transformation, where we modernized our infrastructure across the world with all our fabs, with our, with our factories, and then came along uh, applications and systems transformation. As we started looking at our at our digital footprint, uh, from the time that we uh, that we purchase an asset to the time that we ship a finished good, what can we do? How do we look at this? And that that's a journey that that continues on. Uh, and I think we had to look at it. We had to see what we need to do. How do we look at our processes? How do we look at our, our technology? So we didn't want to lose steam. And from then on, we've been moving uh, you know, fast. I think one of the things that that I get reminded on is uh, one of the MIT professors uh, spoke about how uh, you, know, you move from a caterpillar to a uh, butterfly. But if you lose any parts of it, you become a fast caterpillar. And that's not what we wanted to be. So... I think uh, the the intent was to say we're doing great. We are we are uh, we're making changes. It's working. The business is uh, is also changing fast. And I think we we've got to keep moving this uh, this engine. And I think that's where from a tech support organization to becoming a, a, a visionary organization, uh, the it's a, it's a long journey. It's uh, it's painful, but it is exciting, and it's 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 a way to do it. That's that's the only way forward. And clearly, a, a, a consequential cultural change uh, is necessary to breathe life into all that you've described. And I wonder if you could linger just a moment longer on the cultural implications of what you've described and how you think about bending the culture a little bit. This is oftentimes some of the more challenging changes to make, uh, people's behaviors, ways of working, the mentality and role, et cetera. What are your thoughts there, Satya? You know, Peter, I think this is this is a fantastic question because uh, we usually move, talk about people and we move on to process and technology, but the, the underlying uh, thread across all of this is culture. Uh, no matter what we do, if there is no culture, right? I, I know if there's a cliched uh, thing where Peter Drucker's uh, saying, but I'm not going to talk about that. The point is, culture is extremely important in terms of what we are trying to do and what we've done. And uh, uh, we, we have uh, an amazing uh, culture around, uh, around Skyworks. It's about initiatives, uh, empowerment, working with people, working, you know, brainstorming, um, arguing, and all the, all the essential components that we need to have, right? Passion that we see with, with our own folks. We're very supportive of what we do. We're very collaborative in terms of what we've done. And I always mention that this is a relay race, right? Even if one drops a baton, I think it affects the whole team. So as a team, we need, we need to back each other up. We, we can't uh, afford to fail in this. We need to get together. And I think that's the only way we can do this. And uh, one of my 
my my my my my you know infrastructure leader says that it's a sort of a sibling culture where we argue we argue like like crazy sometimes and but the intent is because we want to make sure that we hear everybody's reasoning everybody's argument in terms of what why we want to do this what's the what's the benefits what's the risk and things like that and i think uh, uh, the most important thing is if there is an issue on hand we make sure that we got everybody here working together and uh, being there for each other um, we also, you know, there are things, there are different ways of getting things done. You manage the objectives, uh, but we want to make the human connection first and everything everything else follows later. Um, and it also has to be top down, bottoms up, inside out, and whichever way you want to think about it. I have an amazing leadership team over, over here as well. And um, I think they've been very, very supportive in terms of what we've been trying to do. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, that that we brought to the table we have a good uh, good process in place so in terms of if you have an idea, how do we sell it and uh, how do we prioritize it? How do we uh, bring it to uh, to fruition and things like that? And I think uh, that that's that's more important. And the, and, the, and the other part is what, you know, Satya Nadella talks about empathy, uh, understanding the pain of the business, understanding why why certain things don't work for us. What can we do? How can we share the pain before we even try to fix it? I think those are things that we, 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 you know, we try to understand. We all know what is required from IT. There's a newfound respect for uh, for what uh, we uh, we can do, for what we you know bring to the table, and I think that to me is um, is extremely important. Uh, I think without that, nothing uh, that nothing rolls. And uh, every project that we do, we don't mince words to say this is going to be a long one. This is going to be a tough one. Are we ready for it? What can we do? How can I help you ease the pain? What can I do to to kind of support you with that? So it's a, it's basically understanding each other's problems and what can we do to kind of fix things? How can we make this happen? We are we are a lean team, but uh, we know how to get things done. That's how we uh, feel about ourselves in terms of what we do. So it, it's it's a culture. I mean, culture is what we make out of it, and how and how do we bring our viewpoints to that? And that's that's how it, it, it's been at uh, at Skyworks. A related topic that I found intriguing from our past conversations is the propensity of your non-technology functions increasingly hiring tech talent and likewise, uh, you hiring into your team people who have broader business skills beyond technology. And I wonder if you could take a moment to talk a bit about the advantages of that cross-pollination. I can already hear, of course, portion of the answers and what you've just described and described in terms of that empathy and the ability to walk in a mile in the shoes of uh, of your colleagues and other functions and so on. Anything else you'd add there just in terms of the the wisdom and insights drawn from, from some of that cross-pollination? No, well, absolutely, right? I think we live in a very interesting time now that, that business is starting to hire more technology folks and technology is trying to hire more business folks. Because I think uh, we we've kind of realized that uh, it is it is essential uh, that that uh, the you know transformation starts with people and how do we bring people with with different uh, bends and and how do we make sure that all the ideas are, are discussed? You know, it used to be that a few years ago we used to talk about the receptivity. How will uh, how do we sell something to the business? How do we sell change to the business? How do we sell uh, a particular solution or technology to the business and things like that. But now things have changed about a, a whole lot. And from uh, from my perspective as as a CIO, I saw at very uh, at, at KPIs that are that are that are hard to measure but easy to see. Like for example, you walk into a into a meeting room, uh, you shouldn't be able to make out the difference between who's IT and who's business. I think uh, the the speak should be very uh, seamless, borderless in terms of how it is. People should be able to talk about technology and talk about business process and talk about uh, how we're going to fuse things together, how we're going to build road mapping. Because road mapping isn't done by one particular group; it's not siloed. It's done by various different leaders, various different groups of people coming together and making things happen. So that's how I, I measure it that way. And if I find out that that I can I can figure out who's IT and who's business, fantastic. Then we are on our way from a, from a from a from a people transformation perspective, right? And I think um, that's that, that's how we, we we believe that that is essential in terms of why why that needs to happen. And uh, an example I can also give you is uh, we just recently went live with our S4 HANA strategy, and um, it was a huge success. The implementation was a success. We, we completed it uh, you know on time and under budget, and which was which was a great feat. But I think the fact of the matter was because of business and IT collaborating well, strong governance. 
uh, understanding that change management is not for one particular function. It is something that has to be with uh, across the organization. It also has to be top down, bottom up too. And I think uh, everybody knew what they had to bring to the table. Everybody had knew what they had to do. Um, so uh, uh, the success of these projects is not just IT success, right? It's an organizational success in, in terms of how you see that. And that's why whether you're tech or non-tech, I think uh, we also live in a world where a lot of the folks who are coming into uh, uh, to uh, into our industry or, or coming to work for the first time have a good amount of uh, of you know IT savviness. They they understand uh, things clearly. They understand what cloud means, what virtualization means, what technologies can 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 do. And in fact, they're bringing in great ideas because they are so they they, they bring in B two C expectations in a B two C in a B two B world. Right. Oh, that's not how I go to Amazon and buy stuff. Or that's not how I do uh, when I play video games. Why can't I have the same experience over here? If I can go to chat GPT and say, tell me about something. Why can't I go to a similar tool within the, uh, the, the business world and type my question and get an like, instant answer? So we, we use those folks to drive that vision forward to say, all right, that's a great point. Now let's roll that back. How, how does that work? So what do you need for that? What's your data set requirement? And then as you start feeling the onion, you start putting together the strategy you start putting together the vision for that and you try to think about what we do what do we need to do to kind of like you know, operationalize that so i think that's why it's uh, uh the the cross pollination is essential in order for a transformation to uh, uh, to to be alive and i think that's uh, that's definitely the success uh, in terms of what we do fascinating i, I appreciate you you uh, sharing those anecdotes um I wanted to also shine a light on the, the fact that among your areas of responsibility is electronic design automation, Satya. Uh, I wonder if you could take a moment just to describe the discipline and some of the innovations you're driving through it. Electronic design automation or, or EDA in the, uh, in the you know, semiconductor world is, uh, is about, uh, especially what we do is making sure the optimization between compute and storage is in tandem with, our, uh, with, with what we want to do. Uh, I think EDA uh, also gives IT uh, a very passive way or, or passive opportunity to contribute to the top line growth of the company. So think about it, a faster compute helps our simulations to get done faster, which means uh, our go-to market strategies are a whole lot faster. So I, I see it from that perspective to say, wow, this is an awesome opportunity to do that. And uh, we, we are working on some, uh, on some you know, transformation strategies around that and how do we how do we bring in some innovation in the strategy? How do we uh, put together a process that's going to help our engineers be more uh, productive and more efficient in the way that they can they can build designs or they can um, get these designs up, you know like a faster to the market and things like that. And, and also there's also an emergence of uh, you know because of AI, right? There are some like you know synergies between transformative solutions um, and uh, engineering compute. So. If you think about uh, uh, the uh, the need for high performance compute, especially with GPUs and all that, to to build uh, some of uh, uh, your own uh, uh, AI strategy or, or to bring to life some of the AI strategies that you have in place, uh, the same uh, high performance uh, compute is also required for for engineering designs and all of that. So there is a lot of synergies between the two, and I think it's very important for us to understand uh, what they can do for the business. And uh, EDA is also an area where uh, if you keep up with the refresh cycle, uh, you're going to actually um, eliminate technical debt and also uh, get faster compute uh, to, your, to your own organization in order to get their you know, work done. And I think uh, it's it's another area that we are that we have taken up recently. We are, we are working on modernizing that. We're working on on optimizing that solution. It, it's my way of saying that now I have a, a, an, an opportunity to add to the top line growth of the company. So it's a very passive approach, but it's still going to help me, uh, uh, you know, get there. But we are we are we're looking forward to that. We have a great, uh, uh, you know, group of uh, EDA folks in the organization who are uh, who are fantastic in what they do, and we're hoping to get there as quickly as possible. That's fantastic. I appreciate you sharing that. Well, we've talked about AI in a few different ways. I, I want to before we before we address it head on. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you a bit about one of the necessary ingredients to be able to to succeed from an AI perspective, and, that, and that's in having a well-articulated data strategy. Um, yours is a data-intensive organization. Can you talk a bit about some of the foundational elements you put in place to ensure that your AI enablement office can identify um, great use cases and establish value? What are some of those foundational layer uh, topics or elements that you put in place? When, when people generally talk about AI, uh, 
there's not much of a conversation about data and uh, one wonders why. I think uh, the most important ingredient uh, for, for AI is data. And uh, I think it's not just data, it's good, clean, single source of truth is what we is how we see it. Um, I think one has to imagine a utopia, right? I mean, if you had a chat GPT engine that is for work, what would you do with that, right? What would you do on a daily basis? You you come to work, so you're, you're, you're trying to get data, you're trying to make decisions, and uh, you want insights, hindsights and foresights of, of, of what happened, what's going to happen, and how do you do all of that, right? If you take that as the, the utopia of having something where you can go in and crunch a few things, get, get the answers that you want, and make things happen, so you peel the layer of, of the AI onion there, and then you start looking at data. And if you start looking at data, you're going to look at what data am I am I looking at? I've got engineering data. I've got manufacturing data. Uh, obviously, I've got uh, enterprise uh, level data, which is in many different systems today. It's in Salesforce. It's in SAP. It's in our manufacturing MES systems. It's uh, in our factory fab systems. It's, it's, it's everywhere. How do you get all of this data? How do you pool this data? How do you pool the right single source of truth too? And how do you sanitize this? How do you build the layers of gold, silver, bronze? And, and how do you bring all of this to life? so that you can then build something for the business to say, here it is, you've got end-to-end -end data. This is what you use to start understanding where you're going with it, where you wanna go with it, what you're doing today, and all of that comes together. So if that is where we want, and that's how we wanna do it, then you, you start looking at our systems of transactions, systems of records, systems of insights, and you start peeling the layer again. And as you start looking at that, that's why organizations that have high technical debt are gonna find it very difficult to move through that because you've got to be very careful in today's world, garbage in is garbage out square. And you, you talk to an engineer, they're going to say, well, square root of garbage in equals. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make is you if you don't feed good, clean data, you're not going to get good, good clean results that you're, that you're looking for. And AI magnifies that too. So it is, it is very important for us to understand our technical stack. It was very important for us to understand what processes we need to fix today, because you can't take a broken process and put it into a system, it's only gonna magnify your broken process. So it's about getting the one percenters right. And, and to me, the, the organizations that get their AI solutions right are the ones that get the one percenters right. How do I fix my process? How do I make sure that my process is clean? It is, it is built for what I'm trying to do. Can I track an asset from, from, inception, from like inception all the way to consumption? And can, am I getting the, that clean source of truth into uh, the the data warehouse or into my data lake and how do I use my data lake to build my ML ops on top of it or how do I build my generative AI engine to 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 look for all of that and um, I think to do all of that you need to start thinking of of how do I do my one percent how do I get my one percenters right you follow a good you have a good foundational model you follow the you have a good hygiene in terms of governance and how do you make sure that you manage this process right? Because it's one thing about putting things together. It's a whole different ball game about sustaining things for you from, from, from there on. And it's, it, it is important for IT organizations to have a very strong focus on governance today uh, because we are starting to see many uh, different organizations bring in a lot of technical technology talent to do a lot of things. I think what will help work all of that or what will help bind all of this together is strong governance. And I think that's very important. And we are realizing that as we are going through our, our own uh, cycle. So I think to me, all of this has to come together and they all have to be in uh, like, you know, synchronicity in, in order for all of this to work. And, and that's where we are looking at, at AI. We're looking at all the use cases. We, we as, uh, as businesses have started to bring in a lot of data scientists, we understand what uh, uh, use cases they have already. They have a lot of fantastic models that that's gonna help the organization be more productive. Also, you know, be better from a, from a product design and things like that, because AI is a force multiplier. That's how we gotta see. And if you're gonna do all of that, then how do we build a good clean hygiene, good governance, good clean data, and good systems that are helping you get your job done efficiently and, and are also sending good data across uh, to the data lake and things like that. So if you get all of those things right, right, then we are on to something. I think that's where we are focusing on the foundation. We're also focusing on the one presenters, but we also have a very keen eye on the big price. So that's the end-to-end that's the -end aspect of what we do.
That's great. A great description there. I, we referenced each of us, the AI enablement office. Can you take a moment to talk about its constitution and its mission? Uh, who's part of the office? Uh, and how do you think about uh, developing new ideas through through that forum? Fantastic. So, I, we, so IT is uh, uh, is leading uh, the AI enablement office. We uh, we are responsible for putting together the foundational infrastructure. We are seen as a as a toolbox. So, if we put if we host the data for you and we give you an ML ops layer, then here here you go. We have democratized this for you. Businesses, come on in. Let's 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 go create things together. So, we also have some some amazing data engineer who are actually electrical engineers. Uh, they, uh, they they understand how the business works. They've been in the semiconductor, uh, semiconductor you know, industry for a, for, a, for a very long time. And they're coming in with ideas. They also have a lot of technology skills. So we are uh, we are collaborating with them and we are trying to put together a number of use cases and, and we're trying to enable them to get these things done. On the other side, we are, we are also um, tapping into our own uh, you know, IT talent pool to see what do you think we need to do? How do you think we need to do this? The investments that we made in our with our business relationship managers who are working who are working closely with the business, those folks are now coming up with ideas of how we can use generative AI to make their processes faster. Right, that is to me the power of what uh, what we have uh, we have harvested over time. Because uh, when our IT finance BRM or our IT supply chain BRM tells us that these are the things that we can do using generative AI. Now, those use cases are all documented and we start looking at where can we find a data source? How can we start bringing this to life? I think that's to me the most fascinating aspect of what uh, we've achieved as an IT organization. And that is that is currently led by my apps leader who's uh, because uh, the purview of the apps organization is pretty big now. It's not just applications, it's applications, data and AI enablement. So it's 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 everything in 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 one place and that uh, that helps speed up things a whole lot faster. Yeah, great, great overview. Thank you for that, Satya. Um, as you uh, think about the future, I'm wondering what trends excite you uh, as you look into your crystal ball. ball. Are there, there are facets, especially as you think of uh, the business visionary uh, perspective that you and your team have? What are some of the things you envision now? These are questions I don't get asked. When I hear this, uh, uh, lots of things are, uh, you know, are in my mind that I, I, I like to talk about. I think the most important thing is to not answer this from a technologist perspective, but more from a from a consumer perspective. Because uh, I think I'm a consumer first, and then a technologist after that. Why? Right? Because I I like to see what's how things are changing in my own personal world. I can tell you from my own perspective, my kids don't ask me anything anymore. <laughs> they, they go to Chat GPT or something like that and get their answers. It's good and bad uh, because uh, I, I think that's that's what it is. Uh, things are changing so fast. How do I consume information today for my own personal life? And then now if I translate that, that's how it's going to be for from, from a business perspective uh, you know, as well. I don't think folks are going to be looking at dashboards to get answers. They're going to be, their questions are going to be very prescriptive. Tell me what uh, this information is, or tell me what my OEE for this particular machine is or something like that. They don't want to see a dashboard to get that information from a bunch of other, you know, like information that's all kind of merged together. It's going to be very prescriptive. It's going to be very precise in terms of what they want and when they want it and how they want it. I think those things are going to change uh, the face of how we do things. And 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 that's why I, I brought this whole B2C expectations in a B2B world, because how we transact in our personal world is how we want to transact in our business world. And if we don't change the business world, we're going to have a problem in the future. And I think that's why the race is on, the race is truly on in terms of how do you get that experience? How do you change that user experience to make sure that that uh, uh, that we, we make things easy for our business? You focus more on, on what you want to do rather than how, how you want to do is what I, I feel like. For example, um, we used to take 80% of our time to gather data and 20% of the time to analyze data. Now it's all flipped, right? We, we take 20% of the time to gather data and 80% of the time to analyze it. And now with AI, even that is going out of our hands too. So I think that's the that's the thing. I think you have to reverse engineer what you expect to see in the new world and build what you need today to, to kind of get there. Um, I think it's going to be it's 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 going to be fascinating. I strongly feel AI is not hype. 
AI is going to be the way, the way that uh, we do things. And the faster you you clean up your technical debt, the the, the quicker you get your uh, your 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 hygiene working well, and uh, you get your data to where it needs to be. I think uh, the faster you're going to get towards your goal. And I think companies are now competing through AI, and that's uh, that's going to be how I see in the future as well. I hear echoes also of of your past comments of the extent to which uh, in our personal lives, we're leveraging these details, the residue of that experience into our business lives are going to be profound, even for a B2B company. And so uh, very, very forward thinking of you to be uh, so clear in your perspective as to the importance of, of, of generative AI and AI more generally speaking. I appreciate those those uh, perspectives, certainly Satya. I do my my vacation travel planning on um, through the use of generative AI, right? I, I I compare products through the use of generative AI because I don't even use a search engine today because I want to go into uh, uh, into a generative AI engine and I want answers that is catered to me. I don't want answers that are listed based on a search engine and for me to decipher, to, to break it apart and then get what I want from there. But if I can go to a generative AI engine, it's going to give me something that's more, more catered to what I want. If I say I want to... I, I, I have a five days holiday and I want, to, I want to go to Hawaii. Where can I stay? Can you plan a vacation schedule or, or a vacation itinerary for me? And it plans according to what I want. Oh, well, I don't want to do too many of rock climbing, more beaches. All right, here's your itinerary. And I want to stay close to the beach. Well, here it is. I don't want to go to a search engine and type what are the hotels next to the beach and all that. So if that is changing the way that I look at it, and if I, um, I want prescriptive, precise answers, there's nothing wrong for the business to think about it the same way. Very well said. Thank you for that. Uh, I wondered here at the close uh, if there's anything you've recently read, listened to, and or watched that you particularly recommend to your peer, Satya. Absolutely. So I, I actually like to read about autobiog uh, autobiographies and uh, because I, I, I try to associate, uh, I, I try to live their lives as they went through their struggle and how they they you know reached uh, the pinnacle of, of uh, you know where they are today. And um, there are many folks, right? I'm inspired by some amazing uh, leaders that we have today. But one thing that I that I recently watched was uh, uh, it was one of your your interviews with uh, you know Rob Carter. I, I had followed uh, Rob on LinkedIn, and I'm I'm a huge fan. But then uh, the personalized he actually humanized a lot of different things, especially the way um, uh, the intentional networking is what he called it when he met uh, his uh, his CIO. Uh, and how that that changed his life, changed his career, and I think the the biggest takeaway for me from that was how Rob left a legacy, how he built leaders, and when he left, one of his leaders took over the mantle. And I think, to me, that shows that uh, leaders are not uh, looked based on the number of followers, but the number of leaders that they create. And I think Rob was the one who who built leaders. Uh, and I think. Uh, I think those are, and I, I, I feel, I felt very inspired. In fact, I, I listened to it twice because I thought I might have lost some, uh, some other finer points. Because as I, as he kept talking, I kept going into this, this analysis of, wow, that's a, that's a very deep thought. Oh, hold on, I missed something else. So it was, it was, a, it was a great story. Uh, these are folks that, uh, that are so humble. You have a lot to learn from, from, from them. It, and to me, it felt like his autobiography in a way as he walked his, his career uh, walk. And I think. Uh, very inspiring, hugely inspiring. CIOs are not chief information officers. They have got to be chief inspiration officers. I think that is, Rob is a chief inspiration officer in my opinion. And I think uh, it, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it, it had a deep impact on, on, on how he saw things and how, and his outlook on technology, more than technology and process to me, I want to know the human side of people because uh, that's more fascinating to me. Uh, more than anything else. Everything else can be learned. Everything else can be acquired. But I think the human side of it is, is just fascinating and interesting. So thank you for that, for that, for that interview. I really appreciate that. No, well, thank you, Satya. That's a very, very generous of you to recommend our, our 900th episode with, with Rob Carter and certainly all, all, all credit to him for, for the remarkable insights that, that he shared there. But speaking of remarkable insights, thank you for the great ones that you provided in this conversation, Satya. I'm, I'm so, uh, Please to shine a light on the great work that you and your team are doing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, a bit about the remarkable transformation that you have led uh, people for stand pop uh, process and, and technology, each of which we've covered uh, from across your six years. 
plus with the organization. It's been a terrific conversation. Thank you, Peter. Likewise, I think I've enjoyed it too. I'll, I just want to leave one last point here is that um, a, a success of a CIO is not success of the person. It's a success of the whole team behind the person, including the leaders for the, for, uh, for the CIO as well as the organization. And so I've been, I've been very, uh, uh, very gifted in that from that perspective. I have had a great team and a great leader and amazing leaders across the board and some lots of people to inspire me along the way. So thank you so much. Again, thank you so much for your time. And uh, uh, I'm honored and humbled to be a part of this, this interview. Thank you. Speaking of humility uh, as a leader, what, what a great way to sum it up. Thank you again, Satya.